Today's video is made possible thanks to Masterworks. If you follow the investment world, I'm sure that you've heard the quintessential champion over the past two decades has been the S&P 500. Right? Well, what would you say if I told you there has been a market that has outpaced the S&P 500 by 131% from 1995 to 2021? It is a market that has been largely inaccessible to the average person, and we're talking about contemporary art. Masterworks is the only platform that lets you invest in multi-million dollar works of art by artists like Basquiat, Picasso, Banksy and more. Here's how the process works. Masterworks' analytics team studies thousands of pieces of data to find financially attractive works with appreciation potential. Then they buy them for amounts ranging from $1 million to $30 million and scrutinize them by filing and offering circular through the SEC. Finally, they hold the work for three to 10 years until it is sold. It is very important to remember, nobody can predict the future and past results are no guarantee of future returns. If you wanna take a look at Masterworks for yourself, here is a link that will allow you to skip the waiting list. And as always, when it comes to investing, be very careful. There is no such thing as a risk-free investment. But now, let me ask you a question. What do you think is the most comfortable and cheapest way to travel between different countries in the world? I'm sure most of you will have answered by airplane. With the rise of low-cost airlines, such as Ryanair, traveling between different cities and different countries has become relatively cheap. In fact, sometimes the airfare is even cheaper than the cab fare from the home to the airport. However, let me show you something. What you are seeing on the screen is the distance between the Italian city of Venice and the Turkish city of Istanbul. At the time of making this video, a one-way economy class flight on 10th of September 2022 with Turkish Airlines costs no less than 330 euros. To some, this price will seem expensive and to others cheap. But the point, and here comes the interesting thing, is that to travel from Venice to Istanbul for the same date, 10th of September, there was a much cheaper alternative and one that was perhaps even more pleasant than the plane ride. You see, boarding the ship Fantasia, a cruise ship belonging to MSC Cruises, costs only 200 euros. Yes, $130 less than the plane, a real bargain. But wait a minute, aren't cruise ships something like luxury mega ships for wealthy people? How can the ticket be so cheap? Well, technically, yes, when we talk about cruise ships, in this case, the MSC Fantasia, we're talking about high-end vessels, cruise ships that are basically authentic floating resorts. We're talking about ships offering unlimited food 24 hours a day, theater shows day in and day out, cocktails of all flavors, soccer fields, live music, jacuzzis, and even water park slides. And all that, with all that service, is cheaper than a two-hour plane flight. In a way, you could say that cruises are a luxury, but a low-cost luxury, perfectly accessible to the middle classes. Although, in case this still doesn't convince you, let me give you one more comparison. Say instead of a seven-day cruise for $200 like the one we've just seen, we decided to rent a four-star hotel in the center of Madrid. You would struggle to get that hotel below 700 euros. That is to say, while a hotel room in Madrid costs at least $100 per night, on a cruise, the cost per night does not even reach 30 euros. In fact, cruises have become so inexpensive and so entertaining that many retirees prefer to embark and live on them rather than in retirement homes. You don't believe me? Do you really think I'm exaggerating? Well, far from it. Check this out. Living on a cruise ship provides a better quality of life and is cost effective for elderly people who need help to live independently, according to a study published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, National Library of Medicine. No matter how you look at it, a cruise ship is cheap, very cheap for the services it offers. So cheap that many of you who have traveled on one of them have probably wondered, how on earth can cruise ships be profitable? How do you pay for fuel, food, service, and entertainment for thousands of people with prices as low as 30 euros a night? Well, the surprisingly simple answer is that they're not profitable. The operating cost of a cruise is much, much higher than the price of the tickets. In fact, cruise lines lose money on the sale of their cabins. Yep, that's what I said. To be more specific, according to a study conducted in 2018, the actual cost of taking care of a passenger on a cruise ship for a week exceeded $1,400 on average. However, the average passage price, taking into account both budget and premium rooms and suites that inflate the average, barely reached $1,000. In other words, for every passenger they carry, cruise ships lose about $400 per week. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. If this is true, if cruise ships lose money on their fares, then the companies that run them are doomed to fail. This is an industry on its last leg where it's impossible to make money, right? Well, to be honest, that doesn't seem to be the case. 
The cruise ship industry, with the exception of the coronavirus hiatus, has done nothing but grow over the past few decades. If we leave out the pandemic years, in the last 10 years alone, the number of people using a cruise ship for their vacations has increased by no less than 56%. All this was accomplished, naturally, by ever-increasing profits. Carnival, which is the world's largest company, went from a net profit of $3.5 billion in 2009 to earning $5.5 billion in 2019. But wait a minute, if a minute ago we just told you that the cost of taking a person on a cruise was higher than the price paid for the ticket, where do these profits come from? Well, visual economic viewers, that is the most interesting question of all. We didn't decide to make a video about cruises because we like them so much, nor because we lack topics to talk about. Far from it. The point is that apart from everything we have just told you, the cruise industry presents a business model that is unique in the world. Contrary to what everyone may think, cruise ship companies do not make money from the sale of tickets, which as we've already seen in many cases, do not even cover the cost of the services offered to passengers. Cruise lines earn all those millions in another way, with a very interesting business model. A business model that for many of you may even seem ruthless. So knowing this, the questions are clear. What is the hidden business behind the cruise ship company? Companies. Where on earth does the money come from, if not from ticket sales? Today on Visual Economic, we will tell you all about it, so stay tuned. When we talk about cruises, we have to talk about the four main companies. Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian and MSC. These four companies alone control more than 90% of the entire cruise ship market. The first three are all American, which makes sense since 50% of the entire cruise tourism market is precisely from the USA. MSC, however, is a company that has been growing strongly over recent years and has taken market share from the North American giants. So let me ask you, no need to Google it, post it in the comments to see who can guess it right. You've got three seconds. Well, time's up. Most of you probably didn't get it anywhere near right. MSC is a company based in Switzerland. Do you realize how strange that is? Switzerland is a landlocked country. How is it possible that one of the four largest cruise lines in the world is based in a mountainous country? Well, let me tell you that the case of MSC and its unusual headquarters is nothing exceptional. As I said, both Royal Caribbean, Carnival, and Norwegian are big American companies that monopolize the market. But are they really American? Let's take Royal Caribbean, for example. If we look up where their headquarters are, what we will see is that they are indeed located in Miami, Florida. But if you look closely, you will actually see that Royal Caribbean International is a subsidiary of the Royal Caribbean Group. And you know where Royal Caribbean Group was incorporated? Well, none other than Liberia, a country that, as you can see on the map, is not exactly close to Florida or any of the usual routes followed by cruise lines. Again, seems rather strange, doesn't it? Well, yes, it is strange, and I'm sure many of you have already realized the main reason for this whole phenomenon of cruise companies in remote countries, low taxes. Technically, when we talk about paying taxes in a country, those taxes must be paid according to the money generated in each country. And as you can imagine, in the case of cruise ships, it is never entirely clear where the money is generated. After all, they are ships that operate in many countries around the world, so they can find legal ways to pay taxes in tax havens or in countries with very low taxation, such as Switzerland, Panama, Bahamas, and Liberia. To give you some data, according to several sources we have consulted, the taxes on profits paid by the supposedly large American cruise companies are barely between 0.5 and 1% effective. This is considerably less than the 21% that companies operating in the USA pay by law. But let's be careful here a moment because this apparent tax saving, in theory, only affects the tax on profits. Apart from this, there are other taxes, such as VAT, social contributions, and income taxes that the ship's personnel have to pay. And that, my friends, is a much more complicated issue. A complicated issue that the shipping companies solve in an even more curious way. Take a look at this. As I said previously, the MSC Cruise Company is registered in Switzerland. However, contrary to what many of you might think, its ships do not fly the Swiss flag. For example, its ship MSC Fantasia, which we mentioned at the beginning of this video, bears the Panamanian flag. And another of its ships, MSC Seashore, its largest vessel to date, flies the Maltese flag. As you can see, it is not only that cruise ship companies are registered in countries that are unusual to say the least, but also that the ships fly the flags of even more random countries. This phenomenon is 
is known as flags of convenience. And the truth is that it applies not only to the cruise industry, but to practically the entire maritime transportation industry, whether it be for cargo or passengers. Now, what is the point of all this? Couldn't the ships bear the same flags as the place where the shipping companies have been registered? Well, it could be possible, but that's just not that interesting. When you are on the high seas, in international waters, the laws that apply depend on the flag the vessel is flying. Evidently, there is an international regulatory framework that, regardless of the flag, establishes legal minimums, especially in relation to criminality. But otherwise, the laws that prevail on a ship are set by the flag. To give you an idea, in 2003, a gas explosion inside a Norwegian cruise line ship killed eight Filipino workers. Not surprisingly, the families of the victims claimed legal liability from Norwegian, which, apart from certain legal maneuvers to pay less taxes on profits is still a US-based company. So what's the problem? Because the ship was not a US flagged vessel. And taking full advantage of this, the cruise line had a contract that in the event of any legal problem with its workers, the trial should take place in the crew member's country of origin. So the US authorities rejected the claim of the victim's families. Failing that, the trial was held in the Philippines and the families received compensation of less than $60,000, which is far less than they would have received if the trial had been held in the US. You know, flag of convenience. As you can probably imagine, flags of convenience also provide a huge savings in labor costs. The countries typically used to fly these flags tend to have weak labor laws and allow low wages and long working hours. To give you an idea, according to the various sources we have consulted, a low-level employee on a cruise ship can be paid between $1.50 and $4 per hour on average. Now, don't think that we're talking about eight-hour days with two days off a week. We're talking about the lowest level cruise workers working seven days a week 12 hours a day on contracts that can last up to 10 months. Can you imagine working at least 12 hours a day for 10 months straight and earning little more than $500 a month? Barbaric by Western standards. Although, well, let's take a moment because here it is necessary to clarify something very important. Although the salaries we have just mentioned are very, very low, in reality, they are only base salaries. If you ever go on a cruise, you will see that the companies will charge you an additional gratuity or service fee. These tips are distributed amongst the workers in addition to the base salary that we have mentioned and can make a base salary of $500 or $600 end up exceeding $2,000. Of course, there were still the 12 hours of daily work, but in many cases, the money was much more than they would have received in their country of origin. Now, why on earth do shipping companies offer such a low base salary, then inflate it by means of almost obligatory tips to customers? The answer, once again, is taxes. You see, if tips were an additional part of the price, then that price would have to include VAT, the sales tax. Also, if it were part of the base salary, some taxes such as social contributions would need to be paid. However, if all that money is channeled through tips, all those taxes are saved. As you can see, cruise ship companies are real experts in dodging the tax authorities. Although all this may seem bad to many, the truth is that cruise lines also have good reasons for wanting to avoid certain laws, often absurd ones of the larger countries. For example, the US law active since 1920 does not allow US flagged ships to be built in other countries, which as you can imagine is not exactly an incentive for shipping companies to use the US flag. On the other hand, the United States also obliges its flagged vessels to have at least 75% of their crew members with a US national and this is a big problem. Generally, people from developed countries do not want to work on the high seas for months and months away from their families, or at least not for a mediocre salary. If shipping companies want to operate, then they need to hire people from all around the world. And that is precisely why cruise ships, which often have more than 2,000 crew per ship, hire people from as many as 50 different countries, mostly from Southeast Asia. Something that, under the strict laws of the US flag, could not happen in any way. With all that said, visual economic community, so far, Far, we've only talked about the tricks that companies use to reduce costs and avoid paying taxes. But there is still the most important aspect. At the beginning of this video, we told you that cruise lines not only do not make money on ticket sales, they even lose money. We said that the real business model is to make money in a very different way. So the question is clear. What is this authentic and mysterious business model of cruise ships? How do they make money if not from tickets? Well, let's look at it. But before we continue, take a look at this graph. More than 70% of the people who are watching Visual Economic are not yet subscribed to the channel. Do you like economics? Do you like to understand why some countries perform better than others? Perhaps you are interested in knowing what inflation, wealth, or the success of political or business measures depend on. Well, if you are interested in all that, and you want to see more videos like this one, 
you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and let's get on with this video. Deep Sea Fishing What you're seeing right now is the distribution under normal conditions of the average costs of the three largest cruise lines in the world. As you can see, about 76% of all costs are fixed, while the remaining 24% are variable. So what does this mean, you may ask? Basically, if it costs a company, let's say 10 million euros to operate its ship full for a week, carrying it with absolutely no passengers would also cost 7.6 million euros. In other words, no matter how many passengers it carries, the cruise ship will always have to face 7.5 million euros in fixed costs. And do you realize what this means? It means that in reality, it is very, very cheap for the cruise lines to carry passengers. It makes no difference to them whether they carry one more or one less passenger. But that's in terms of cost, because in terms of revenue, my friends, in terms of revenue. It's a completely different story. Check it out. As we told you at the beginning of this video, this graph shows the average ticket price of a cruise line. As we also told you, with that money alone, cruise lines lose about $400 per passenger per week. But now, look at this. This new bar that has appeared on the screen represents onboard revenue. This is the revenue from sales made to passengers on board the cruise ships, and it accounts for more than 60% of the original ticket price. These sales comes from the shops massages, premium beverage packages, and even casinos and sightseeing excursions at destination ports. And here, right here is the key. If we add to the cruise ticket price all the money that passengers voluntarily spend while on the ships themselves, the companies go from losing $400 per passenger to earning almost $300, which for a ship carrying about 6,000 passengers means weekly profits of almost $2 million. So now think about it. On the one hand, we know that putting more and more people on a ship costs shipping lines very little money. But on the other hand, we also know that what really makes the business profitable is the revenue generated on board. So here's a question. What would you do to earn more and more money if you owned a cruise line. Indeed, make the ships bigger and bigger and to make sure they are always full. The aim of the shipping companies is to manufacture cruise ships that can carry more and more people, to offer cheap tickets so that the ship is always full, and to establish spaces with paid services so that customers empty their wallets on the high seas. You could say that apparently the cruise business is in fishing, but not in catching fish, but in hooking in wallets. All of this can be seen in the evolution of cruise ships themselves. For example, in 2008, the world's largest cruise ship could only carry 4,560 passengers. Today, the largest cruise ship is capable of carrying up to 7,000 people. 7,000 people who, unlike in 2008, can spend their money on many more services that simply did not exist before. From Formula One simulators, to karting tracks inside the ships themselves, climbing areas, or even private islands. Yes, islands in the middle of the Caribbean that shipping companies have bought for their customers to spend all their money on. Do you want proof? Well, take a look. You may be wondering where on earth do shipping companies get the money to build bigger and bigger ships or to buy islands? Ah yes, visual economic viewers, that is a very, very interesting question. The answer is that the money comes from their own customers. Customers who pay for their tickets months in advance, thus virtually making thousands of loans to the shipping companies. Thanks to all these upfront payments, companies like Royal Caribbean and Carnival received more than $5 billion interest-free in 2014 alone. With that money, they were able to carry out their mega projects and save $163 million in interest payments. As you can see, the cruise ship business is a massive business, a business where companies lock their passengers on a ship and seduce them to spend more and more money. The real business is in the sales not in the travel. In any case, having reached this point, it's your turn. What do you think of how the cruise industry works? Do you think that their tax avoidance schemes are immoral? Or is it the price to pay for luxury travel at bargain prices? Would you like to go on a cruise now that you know how the industry really works? You can leave your answers in the comments. If you like this video, like it, activate the little bell icon so you don't miss any of the following videos. And I'll see you in the next one. All the best, see you soon.